I want you to imagine that in some way, shape, form, or fashion, God sends you a message, a message such that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is God speaking directly to you. And let's say that that message tells you that God is getting ready to do something really great in the world and he's chosen you to have an important part in it. How would you respond? Well, can I tell you in a very real way, God does speak that message to us all the time. God wants to use each and every one of us. Maybe not in a way that we would think is important, but you know in God's plan, anything that we do in obedience to him is important. But if you could imagine it being some big, giant thing, that's what we've been looking at last week, and we're going to look at it again this week as we continue in this new sermon series we started a couple weeks ago called The Story of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. And if you missed either of the previous ones, you can go back and listen to them or watch them online. But as we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke, looking at this story of Jesus, we saw the introduction the first week. Then last week, we took a look at this story. It was actually the story before the story. okay? And it was about a priest named Zechariah. And God sent a message to Zechariah through an angel. An angel named Gabriel. Only one of two, or one of two angels that are named Gabriel. In God's word. And by the way, the word angel, the title angel, means messenger. And so Gabriel comes to Zechariah, this priest, during a very special time for him. And you can listen to it uh, online if you didn't hear it. And he says, listen, God is getting ready to break into history and do some phenomenal stuff. And I want to use your and your, you and your wife to have a son. And your son is going to prepare the way. For the Messiah. Now that's a paraphrase of all the things that the angel's telling Zechariah. And, and this was a very unusual message in the fact that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were way too old to have children, so it required a miracle. But this angel showed up and said that. Well, today we're going to take a look at another message sent through the same angel, Gabriel, to a young lady that you are probably familiar with, at least know by name. Her name is Mary. And God has a very similar message for her. He says, listen, I'm getting ready to do some phenomenal things in this world. And I want to use you. Well, what was Mary's response? Her response is the title of the message today, and that is, yes, Lord. Very simple. Very simple. She didn't get all the details. She was a little bit confused. She was wondering why God would even choose her. When he told her what she wanted, he wanted her to do, she's like, how can that happen? But in spite of all that, she said, yes, Lord, whatever you want. And so we're going to take a look at that story in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And we're going to work our way through that story bit by bit, piece by piece, and talk about what's happening there and what it means. And then when we get to the end, we're going to talk about how that might apply to our lives today. So let's jump into the story. And the first part of the story talks about Gabriel's important mission. Gabriel being this angel, this messenger from God. God's already sent him to Zechariah. Now he's sending him to Mary with this very important mission. Let's look at verses 26 and 27 of Luke chapter 1. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Here's this very important mission of Gabriel. And it says that God sent him in the sixth month. That must mean he, must have, he sent him in June, right? No, that's our calendar. If you go to the Jewish calendar, it'd be a whole different month, but that's not even what it's talking about. You know, sometimes people will look at a verse and they try to figure out what it means, and all you got to do is just read it in context. Look at the verse before that. Two verses before that. In verse 24, it says, After these days, Zechariah's wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden. In other words, for the first five months, she just stayed out of the public and just rested or whatever. And then it goes on to say, in the sixth month. So the sixth month means the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Whenever that was, whenever it was that the angel Gabriel had showed up to Zechariah and said, hey, you're going to have a son. No, it's impossible, but God can do it. She got pregnant, and she goes and, and just basically stays out of the public view for five months. Well, in the sixth month, six months after that happens, God sends Gabriel to this woman woman named Mary. 
Now, Gabriel, we didn't talk much about it last week. He is only one, one of only two angels that are named in Scripture, the other being Michael. And God uses him to bring very, very important messages. But the last time that we have recorded in Scripture where God used him to bring an important message was 500 years before this, when he went to take a message to Daniel. You can read about that later. And we mentioned last week that it had been 400 years since God had spoken at all through a prophet or anybody, and now he's getting ready to break into history again by bringing Jesus Christ So he says he sends him to Galilee. Well, six months before, he sent him to Zechariah in Jerusalem, which was the center of the Jewish nation, the the capital, the center of their worship. Galilee is way up north, far away. And he says in the Galilee, he sends him to this town called Nazareth. Now, we know about Nazareth because of the story of Jesus. But at that day, Nazareth was a very small town town with a bad reputation. You may remember, if you're familiar with the story, that when Jesus is grown and he begins his ministry, somebody is sharing about Jesus with a friend. He says, you got to come meet this Jesus. <laughs> He's from Nazareth. And his friend says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> That's the kind of reputation it had. John 1, it says that. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But it says, in this little podunk, if you want to call it, town, off the beaten path, about six miles away from the the biggest major trade route road, is this girl. She's a virgin. She's young. She's betrothed. We'll talk about that in just a moment. She's probably in her early to mid-teens. Because in that day and culture, the young people grew up and matured, not necessarily physically, but emotionally and their abilities a lot quicker. They didn't have to get as much of an education. They were ready to enter life much at a younger, much younger age. And so girls would become betrothed when they're in their early teens. And a year later, they would get married. You see, being betrothed is similar to our custom of being engaged. Parents would work out an agreement between themselves of this young man and this young woman that were going to get married. The young people did have a voice in it, but it was primarily arranged by the parents. And once the agreement was made, there was a contract drawn up. There was a bride price that was paid from the groom to the bride's parents, and they were then betrothed. There was an official ceremony, and unlike our engagement, it was so serious that the only way it could be dissolved was either by death of one of the two parties or by divorce. And for a year, they would still live in their parents' homes and stay separate. And any time they got together, they were chaperoned. But then after that year, they would actually have the wedding ceremony. So this young lady named Mary is betrothed to Joseph. And God says, I want to use you in some phenomenal way. And he sends Gabriel to give this important message. The second thing we see in the story is Gabriel's gracious greeting. Look at verses 28 to 30. It says, and Gabriel came to Mary and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So Gabriel brings this meeting, this this greeting. He says, Mary, you are a highly favored young lady in God's sight. In fact, he mentions it twice, verse 28, verse 30. He talks about her being favored. That word for favored has the same root word as God's grace. And he just says, Mary, you are a special recipient of God's grace. Now, to be honest with you, each and every one of us are a special recipient of God's grace. Because God loves us all so much and he paid such a high price Through Jesus, now that's not happened yet in this story, but through Jesus coming and his death on the cross to purchase the price for our sins. But in this case, in this story, Mary has been specially chosen and singled out for an extra special anointing of God's grace for what he's getting ready to call her to do. He says, listen, God is with you. The Lord is with you. 
And again, we get so used to kind of hearing that, and we know the scriptures that say that God is always with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us, and that's wonderful. But whenever that phrase is used in scripture, and it's used in a couple different places, it talks specifically that God is going to do something in you and through you, and he wants you to know that he is with you. He will continue to be with you, and he will be there not only in presence, but in power to do what needs to be done in and through you. And again, that same thing is true with us. We can know that wherever we go, whatever we do, God is always with us, whether we sense his presence or not. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And whatever he calls us to do, whether it's just a simple act of obedience to his word or because of something specific that he tells us as an individual he wants us to do, he will be with us to help us, to provide for us, to give us what we need to do what he's asked us to do. And it says that when she heard this message, she was greatly troubled. Why was she greatly troubled? I believe that the reason she was troubled is she's thinking, I think maybe you got the wrong person. I think she's thinking, why in the world are you talking to me? I'm just a young woman. I'm poor. I'm in this little podunk town. I don't have any special gifts. I don't have any special abilities. I'm not anybody important. Now, this is just my opinion, but I think that that's why he turns around the angel and says, do not be afraid, Mary. He mentions her name, says, yes, I've got the right person. I'm talking to you. But before we go on, can't, can't you kind of relate to that? Haven't been there, there have been times in your life maybe when, when, when God's doing something or speaking to you and, and calling you to do something maybe or, 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 or to a, a certain uh, I don't know, ministry or just to do something for him. You're like, God, I don't, are you really, you really want to use me? I'm not anybody important. I don't have any great gifts. I don't, uh, you know, I don't have any great resources. You know, the point is we see it over and over in the scripture that God can use anybody in anything. And he most often uses what we would consider to be insignificant to do significant things. You know, we think about all the great heroes of the Bible, and it works for history too. You know, they all started out as a little baby. They all started out as someone who really didn't have a lot of talent or ability or resources, unless their family had resources that they kind of inherited. You look at all the great heroes of Scripture, and they started out very humbly. King David, all the judges, the various leaders that God called to do things in His plan and in His purpose. Now it says that she was highly favored. Why was it that she was highly favored? Well, it wasn't because of some kind of goodness in and of herself, but it was because of God's grace. Because of God's grace. The next part of the story is Gabriel's unusual message. After he had come on this important mission, and he greets her in this very gracious way. He has this very unusual message, verses 31 to 33. He says, after saying, you found favor with God, he says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. He says, behold. Whenever you see a behold in Scripture, he says, pay attention. This is important. He says, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and call his name Jesus. And he lists all these different titles and characteristics and roles that Jesus will play and how much of this did Mary really understand not near as much as we do today looking back and seeing who Jesus grew up to be and what he was revealed to be and who he was revealed to be but some of these things are really interesting to meditate on especially here as we're entering into Christmas time the things that he says about Jesus about um this son that she's going to bear, he says, you shall call his name Jesus. This Jesus is going to be a savior. Now, he doesn't say savior, but the name Jesus literally means Yahweh saves or the Lord saves. A little piece of trivia in case you don't know it, that the name Jesus is exactly the same as the Old Testament name Joshua. 
It's just Joshua is in, from Hebrew and Jesus is from the Greek. Joshua also means the Lord is Savior or the Lord saves. And we see that that's exactly what Jesus came to do and came to be. You know, the angel Gabriel is going to show up and talk to Joseph because when Joseph finds out his fiancée, we'll call her her fiancée, his betrothed is pregnant and he knows he's not the reason she's pregnant, he's having some questions, as we all would. And so God has to send Gabriel to talk to him and say, listen, Mary's telling the truth. You need to go ahead and carry through with your plans. You've got an important part to play in this too. And that story is found in Matthew. It's not found in Luke. But in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when he's talking to Joseph, Gabriel tells Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul gives what I think is the most succinct explanation and summary of why Jesus came in any place in Scripture. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, Mary didn't understand all this stuff at this moment. But here's the seed of this thought. That this son that she is going to bear is to be called Jesus, which means the Lord saves and he will be the Savior. We also see that he is Jesus, the great one. Verse 32 says, he will be great. Great what? Great at what? It doesn't really explain. It just says he is going to be important. He's going to be great. Now looking back, we can see that Jesus is great in love. And Jesus is great in forgiveness. And Jesus is great in compassion. And Jesus is great in power. And Jesus is great in sacrifice. And we could make a list a lot longer than that of all the ways that Jesus is great. But here's just the foundation that this son is going to be great. He says that he is going to be the son of the Most High. Jesus, the son of the Most High. And again, what of this did Mary understand? We don't know for sure, but probably not much. Definitely not as much as we know today. But we know today by looking back and seeing what resulted in all the teaching that came out of that. That Jesus was God himself become man. He's fully God, fully human. I like what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. I like that. John put it this way in John 1.14. He says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the writer of Hebrews writes about this and the Paul in Colossians talks about how when Jesus came God in the flesh that he was able to the degree that it can be revealed in humanity God was revealed in and through him and the last thing the angel says about Jesus is that Jesus is going to be the king of God's eternal kingdom the king of God's eternal kingdom he says the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no rain. Mary did understand what he was talking about here. Maybe not how it was all going to be fulfilled. But it goes all the way back to the promise that all the Jewish people clung to so desperately. We've talked about it many times. That again, there had been 400 years since the last time God had spoken to his people. And all along the way and at that time, 400 years before, God said, I am going to break back into history. I am going to send someone to establish the kingdom once again. He'll be preceded by someone, and that's John the Baptist. We talked about that last week. And that person became known as the Messiah, the anointed one. That's what Christ literally means. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is the Greek form of the word Messiah, the anointed one, the one that's going to be sented, sent from God by God to reestablish God's kingdom on earth and to bring about peace and prosperity. At this time in history, when the angel's talking to Mary, they had no idea it was going to be God himself. They just thought that God was going to raise up some special person to do this. But they're waiting for that. And it's all in fulfillment to a promise that God made to David long before. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, God had told David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established 
forever. Now what you have to understand is by the time Gabriel is speaking to Mary, there has been no descendant of David on the throne of the nation for 500 years. There must have been people that wondered what was going on. Everybody, I'm sure, was wondering, God, you made this promise that a descendant of David would always be a ruler forever over your people. And again, through the years, God had told them, I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to raise him up. In fact, a picture that was often used is that the kingdom was like his great big tree, and then it got cut off, and you just got this stump. But that's okay, because there's still life in the roots. And from that stump is going to shoot up. And that's one of the, the, the words that we're not as familiar with that's used of Jesus is the shoot that comes up. Okay. And so the people have been clinging for 500 years to this hope that one day they would have another king of the line of David on the throne. And Bible scholars say that during this time in history, every Jewish young woman prayed in hope that maybe she would be the mother of the Messiah of the one who had come to reestablish David's kingdom. I'm sure Mary had those hopes in her heart. And Gabriel comes to say, basically, you are the one. You are the one. You know, that points out another issue that's not really the focus of the message, but something we can cling to. There are times that God makes promises to us. There are times that we believe God wants to work in a certain way in our life, and it's like nothing is happening. And nothing has happened for a long time. And we may begin to feel like, well, it's just not going to happen. Maybe God's forgotten. Maybe God's rejected me. Maybe God's not going to keep his promise. But God always keeps his promise. In this case, it was 500 years, but God kept his promise. And since Jesus was that king that was to come, and he is God himself, and he still is alive, and he reigns from heaven, he has kept his promise, and it's done now. He's reigning over God's kingdom in a spiritual sense, but he will come one day to reign over God's kingdom in a physical sense also. So all these things were described to Mary. What did Mary understand about this? We don't know for sure, but again, not as much as we do. But she knew that God wanted to do something special. She knew that the son that she was going to have would play an instrumental part in God's plan because God made it very clear. And can I tell you that one of the reasons I believe that Luke includes this story in his telling the story of Jesus is to get people thinking about who is this son? Who is this Jesus? What did the angel mean when he said that God said that he was going to be great and he's going to establish the kingdom? And what did God really mean? Because Early on in the story, Luke wants people to be wondering that. So as he begins to tell the story of Jesus and continues through and he gives demonstration of all the things that Jesus said and did, there'd be this growing conviction. Jesus really is God. Jesus really did come to accomplish God's purposes. Jesus really did come to die for the sins of the world. And I would just also say this, that if you are one of those, whether you're here or you're watching online, and you've not come to that place of really believing that Jesus is who I've just described him to be and who we believe the word of God tells us he is, and you're wondering and you're kind of exploring it, I just want to challenge you and ex encourage you to continue to explore these things that have been claimed to see if it really is true for yourself. We get to the fourth part of the story, and that's, Mary's wondering question, verses 34 to 37, it says, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary asked this question, how will this be? Now, if you were here last week or if you're familiar with the story we talked about last week, when the angel Gabriel told Zechariah that him and his wife were going to have this son, and this son was going to be the one to prepare the way for the Messiah and all that kind of stuff, Zechariah's response was, <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing here, right, and how am I going to know this is going to really be true? 
It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a statement of a lack of faith. It was like, this is an impossible thing. This can't happen. Now, now don't misunderstand me. Zechariah was a great, godly man. And God didn't reject him because of his doubt. There were consequences to it. The angel said, you want a sign? Okay, you're not going to be able to say. And, and, and the context makes it clear that he couldn't hear anything until the baby's born. But it was a gentle rebuke for his doubt. Now Mary's asking a question. Why is she not rebuked? Because her question is not coming out of doubt. When you read it and you look at it in context, basically what she's saying, okay, God can do that, but there's one little thing we've got to figure out how that's going to happen. I'm a virgin. How am I going to have a baby? Whether in the words that we have recorded here or other things that were said, because there could have been other things said that Luke did not write down, she knew or had this assurance that this is going to happen without the influence of Joseph. And so it wasn't an expression of doubt. It was an expression of, okay, you say this is going to happen. I'm willing, but there is this one little issue. And so the angel gives her the answer, and the answer basically is, it's impossible in the natural, but there's nothing impossible to God. And that's the way he wraps it all up. As we read at the very end here in verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. But he says, listen, you, yes, you are a virgin, but God is going to bring this about. He says it's going to happen in, 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 in with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And, and God will overshadow you. And that, that phrase is what's used of God's glorious presence in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the cloud of fire, in the, in, in the cloud during the day, God's presence with His people. You know, He says, God will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will be involved in it. It doesn't really get into any details other than to say that God's going to make it happen. God's going to make it happen. Now remember, Luke is a doctor. He knows how babies come into this world. And we talked last week about he, how he had the opportunity, more than likely, to interview Mary. And that's why we have such a detailed account of what happened to her and what the angel said to her. And Luke was convinced, even as a doctor, it was the supernatural, miraculous power of God through the involvement of the Holy Spirit. As we mentioned last week, the Holy Spirit is a theme that Luke brings up over and over and over again in his gospel and then the book that follows, the book of Acts, that God, through his Holy Spirit, works in and through his people with power and anointing. Now, I have to admit that this is one of the major sticking points for people in the story of Jesus and of Christianity. The virgin birth, that's just impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. And you know what? They're right. It is impossible. That's why God had to bring it about. What amazes me is that there's even some people who claim to be Christians and believe in God and God's word and God's power that say, well, that didn't really happen that way. That must have just been a figurative thing or whatever. But you know what? If we can believe that God created this world and everything around it, the universe and everything out of nothing, why could he not cause a virgin to become pregnant under his power? Matthew tells us that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. You can look that up for yourself. But he says here that this child that will be born will be called holy. We might say, of course he's holy, he's God. But again, the root word of holy means to be separate. And that's really what is at the, 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 the uh, definition of this word here, that he will be separate, he will be different from every other and any other child ever born. Not just because he is God, but because he is God, he will be free from the sinful nature that every human possesses because of the sin of Adam way back at the beginning. Now, Mary doesn't ask for a sign, but God gives her one through Gabriel anyway. He says, I'll give you an example that God can do the impossible. Your relative, Elizabeth, we don't know what kind of relative uh, she was, some translations say your cousin or whatever, but the word is very vague, just some relative. Your relative Elizabeth is pregnant. God was involved in that too. She's in her sixth month. And we're going to see next week in the next story that Mary goes to visit with Elizabeth and spends some time with her. And they have a great visit together. The last thing we have in this story is Mary's submissive response. The last verse of this passage in verse 38 
after hearing all this, dealing with a lot of different emotions, and maybe has, I'm sure she has a lot of other questions that she's not asking, not really understanding it all, not feeling worthy of it all, she still responds in verse 38 by saying, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but did Mary have a choice? Or did God just show up with Gabriel and say, this is what's going to happen, like it or lump it? I believe she had a choice because God doesn't do that. God always gives us a choice, but I believe that there was such confidence in Gabriel and there was no need to say, will you do it? Because God chose Mary deliberately because he knew that she'd be willing to do it. She said, yes, Lord. To simplify it, down to the title of our message today, yes, Lord. And we'll get into the application in a little bit to our lives, but I just want to challenge you to begin thinking about that. What would it take, what does it take for you to say, yes, Lord? She had a choice, but she said, yes, Lord. Now, I want you to understand what the circumstances were under which she said, yes, Lord. She said, yes, Lord, in spite of not feeling worthy. She said, yes, Lord, in spite of not knowing the details of God's plan. Because if you think about it, the details are pretty sketchy here from what the angel told her. She didn't know all the details. She didn't know how it was going to all work out. She said, yes, Lord, not even understanding how it could be possible. And she said, yes, Lord, in spite of the many problems that this very possibly and probably would cause for her. And we'll talk about those in just a little bit. But she said, yes, Lord. In their culture, Lord meant that you are the master, I am the servant. To get really down to the nitty gritty of the meaning of that word, I am your slave. That's not a popular thing to talk about today, but basically it's I am fully and completely surrendered to you and what you say goes. She was absolutely surrendered to God and his plans. Yes, Lord. And of course, that paved the way for Jesus to come, as we're going to be studying the next couple of weeks leading up to Christmas and the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. But we're going to stop there for today, and I want to talk for just a little bit about the lessons that we can learn from Mary's example. There are some people in certain religious traditions that almost worship Mary, and they pray to Mary, and, and that was never God's intent. Mary was just a humble, young lady from an insignificant background that God chose to use in a powerful way. She did get married to Joseph. Spoiler, you probably already knew that. They had other children, Scripture says. And she is to be admired for her response to God and what she allowed God to do in and through her. But she's not to be worshipped. She's not to be prayed to. We pray to God through Jesus Christ. But there are some lessons that we can learn from her example. Mary was miraculously used by God because of two things. First of all, Mary was miraculously used by God because of her faith in the word of God, even though it seemed impossible. Mary was miraculously used by God because of her faith in the word of God, even though it seemed impossible. She did not doubt like Zechariah. But she believed the word that God sent through this angel, Gabriel. Just a very simple faith. He says, this is what God wants to do in and through you. And she's like, okay, but how's that going to happen? Because I'm a virgin. And so she got the answer. And let me just say, we're going to see next week as we take a look at her visit with Elizabeth. They're just praising God, having a great worship service together. And she begins to sing this glorious worship song and it's obvious that she knows God's word and I just want to throw this in as a side note here if we're going to follow her example then we need to have faith in God's word but if we're going to have faith in God's word we need to know what God's word says but she had faith in the word of God even though it seemed impossible but the second thing is Mary was miraculously used by God because of her submission to the will of God even though it seemed difficult. 
In other words, she said, yes, Lord. She didn't say, well, maybe, God, or let me think about it. In fact, did you notice when she said yes? She said it immediately. She said it immediately without totally understanding, without feeling worthy, without having all her questions answered. She said, God, if you want this of me, I say yes. I say yes. Now, I mentioned earlier that there were some possible negative consequences. You have to understand that being in her situation... A poor young woman in a small town engaged to be married, betrothed to Joseph. By her saying yes, as this began to take place, what are some things that could happen and in the natural probably would happen? First one is she'd be rejected by Joseph. As every young woman in a situation like this, at this time in history, she was probably so excited about her wedding. We don't know how far away it is, It's somewhere in that year between betrothal and the wedding, but she's probably excited. She's making all kinds of plans. It was a big celebration, many times lasting for a full week in their culture as all the family and friends would gather together to celebrate with the bride and groom. And now she needs to tell Joseph she's pregnant and he had nothing to do with it. Joseph will probably reject her. And under the Old Testament law, he can have her stoned. That wasn't practiced really that much in their culture at that day. Instead, usually there was just a divorce. And you read the story in Matthew, that's exactly what seemed to be happening because Joseph finds out. And it says he decided that he, because he loved her so much, he was going to divorce her, but he wasn't going to make a big public spectacle out of it. He was just going to kind of do it behind the scenes and then they would just both go on with their lives. So she was going to lose this man that she very probably, possibly loved dearly and was looking forward to spending the rest of her life with. And thankfully, that wasn't part of God's plan. God instead sent, Andriel to, uh, sent Gabriel to Joseph to help him know that this was God and he could get with the plan. But even with Joseph deciding to go ahead and marry her, she faced ridicule, contempt, rejection by family members and friends. Even if the family members and friends believed that she was pregnant because of Joseph, that was still a very shameful thing in their culture. And even though Joseph said, I'll take her for a wife, in fact, that might have been something to make them even think that it was, well, Joseph did it. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. But he's still going to take her to be wife. He'll take care of her. But they were all still uh, facing, or, or they all would look at them with shame and rejection because of what they had done that they weren't supposed to. If Joseph would have rejected her, she probably never would have been married because she'd have been that type of woman that nobody would ever want to marry. You just didn't do that in their culture. And because of that, she'd have no one to support her as she got older. Not only that, but she could be kicked out of her parents' house. She would have no one to support her from then on. Back then, it wasn't like a woman could go out and get a job and support herself. She could be forced into begging or prostitution to just live. When her son grew up, he would be rejected, and we definitely see that. You see little snide remarks from time to time in the Gospels. The religious leaders, well, we know who our father is, and the idea being, you're not even sure who your father is, do you? But her son would be rejected. And the last one I've got on my list here, she would be considered crazy. You know, she tries to explain, you know, I'm pregnant, but that's okay, God did it. How many people would really believe that? All these consequences, all these things, but yet immediately she said, yes, Lord, if it's, you know, I know it's you, if this is what you want, yes. May your word be fulfilled in my life. You know, we mentioned this a little while ago. God uses the ordinary to do extraordinary things. And as we're looking at Mary's example, I just want to let you know that God wants to use you. Now, you're not going to give birth to God's son. You may not do something or be something or carry out some kind of whatever that's going to be well-known throughout the world or throughout the realm of Christianity. But God wants to use you. And how do I know that? Because God wants to use every single one of us. God wants to use you, even if you feel unworthy or insignificant. 
And as we look at Mary's example, God can do anything through you in spite of whatever limitations you may think that you have. Now, that doesn't mean that we can just set out and say, well, I'm going to do this for God. It looks impossible, but I'm going to do it because God promised he's going to take care of me and he's going to help me do it. No, God gets to decide what he asks us to do. But if he asks us to do something, he will help us to do it. He'll provide what's needed. He'll provide the power in his presence. So as we wrap this up, I just want to say this. God will use you if you respond the same way Mary did. God will use you in your world. God will use you in the lives of the people around you. God will use you in your workplace. He'll use you in school. He'll use you in your family. If you have faith in the word of God, even when it seems impossible. And if you will submit to the will of God, even when it seems difficult. You know, I want to focus in on that last thing that she said as we... Uh, look to how this might apply to our lives. She says, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Can we say that? Lord, you saved me. I am fully surrendered to you. You call the shots. I am your servant. I exist only to do what you want me to do. May your word be fulfilled in my life. Now we look at that and it sounds like some big, grand and glorious thing like I'm going to really fully sell out to God and God's going to use me in a powerful way in my workplace, in my school, in my youth group, in my church. And, and God will do that and God wants to do that. Your definition of powerful and his may be different, but he will do that. But can I tell you that this applies to the simple areas of our life too? In other words, when she said, let it be to me according to your word, she basically was saying is, God, whatever your word says, I'm going to do that. And if God is stirring your heart and challenging you that this is the kind of commitment you really want and need to make to God, it starts with the little things. Can you honestly say, God, whatever your word says about my marriage, I'm going to do that. God, whatever your word says about the kind of person I am at work and my character there and the way I do my job, I'm going to do that. God, whatever your word says about my finances, I'm going to do that. God, whatever your word says about my sexuality and how I express it and when and how and with whom, I'm going to do that. God, whatever you say about any area of my life in your word, I'm going to do that. Because you see, if we made some big, giant commitment like, God, I'm surrendering to you. Take my whole life. I want to be used by you. But we're not willing to do it in the little things. We haven't really done it, have we? And so as we come to a place of commitment in response to God's word, I challenge you not only to, to be willing to say, God, whatever you want, here I am. I'm yours. But that you look at the little areas of your life and say, am I already doing that? And, and be bold enough to say, God, is there an area in my life where I'm not surrendered to your will, where I'm not living out what your word says I should be doing? Because that's probably one of the first places you need to attack and begin to apply God's word and your surrender. You know, it's as we respond to God in that way, as individuals and as a church, that God will move in and through us and use us and he already is god's doing such great things in my life and i know he's doing great things in your life i hear the testimonies god's doing great things in our church and and through our church and our community and the surrounding area but i believe god wants to do so much more and he will but it will come as each of us comes to god and say god whatever it is you want let it be to me according to your word Whatever you say, it's fine with me, God. Work it out. It looks kind of impossible. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't feel worthy. But God, if it's your plan, I'm in. Show me. Help me. Thank you for your promise. You're going to be with me. Guide me and lead me all along the way because it's a step-by-step -step process. But God, here I am. And I challenge you and encourage you to make that kind of a commitment today. Over all your life, but over the details that God may be speaking to you about. I'm going to invite you to stand. 
I'm also going to ask the elders that are available and able to come. Our worship team is going to lead in a song, and this is the time when we encourage you and challenge you to respond to God's word. To say, God, how does this apply to me? And you do what you need to do. I can't make you do it. I can't even tell you what you're supposed to do. But as God speaks to your heart, you make the commitments you need to make. You make the determination that you need to make. But we will be down here that if you want prayer for anything, you want us to join with you in prayer about anything, we'd love to do that, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else. And if by any chance you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never surrendered your life to Him, we would love to have the opportunity to help you, to, to help you pray through and do that yourself. So let's take this time to respond to God's Word in just a little bit. I'll come back and close our service in prayer. How many of you want to see a victory in your life? Amen? Can I tell you, it comes the same way what we talked about this morning. You surrender everything to God and you do what He tells you to do. That's how victory comes. Father God, we come to You right now thankful for Your goodness to us, Your mercy, Your grace. Lord, we, uh, we, we have been blessed, Lord God, like You talked to Mary that she has been highly favored. Lord, we have been the recipients of your favor through Jesus Christ. And God, our best response is to say, God, you saved us, so here we are. But we struggle with that sometimes. So I pray today as we've been challenged once again to follow the example of Mary and other people in your word to say, God, I am your servant. You saved me. I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for you. I want to love and serve you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one of the best ways to do that is by loving and serving others in our world and in your kingdom. So God, guide and lead each of us as to what that means. God, I pray that you guide and lead us in every area of our life that we need to surrender to you, to continue to walk in that surrender, because sometimes we take things back. But God, also in your purpose and your plans for us, whatever it is that you want us to do, however you want us to make an impact in our family, in our school, in our workplace, in our community, in this church, guide and lead us, Lord God, and help us to be faithful to you. And Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have promised as you did to Mary that you will be with us to empower us. And Lord, just to have your presence with us. Thank you, Lord. As we leave this place today and go out into this week, help us, Lord God, to make a difference for you. Lord, we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.